Hi, my name is Sylvia Johnson and I'm Chief of the Thermal Protection Materials and Systems Branch at NASA Ames, and that's in California. Uh, NASA has lots of interests, of course, but one of our major ones is bringing vehicles back from space. And that's vehicles with people on them, like, like the Space Shuttle or the new vehicle Orion, or of course, missions that are going to the planets and maybe bringing back samples. If we want to do that, that means that we have to be able to protect those vehicles from all of the stresses and the heat of re-entry. Uh, that's quite a different prospect as when we're thinking about other high temperature materials. What we're really trying to do with thermal protection materials or thermal protection systems is to protect the underlying structure of the vehicle. Now we can do that in a number of ways and it really depends upon how fast the vehicle is coming back in, what the shape of the vehicle is and how big it is, what the size of the planet is, uh, a number of things. But when we have vehicles like the Space Shuttle, for example, they can use reusable TPS. Uh, many of you, many people have seen those materials, those are fibers. They have very, they're very insulating materials and very, very lightweight. And those are ceramic materials, those were, in fact, a lot of the development was done in our laboratories, but quite some years ago. But in fact, we're still working on some of those materials. We're putting coatings on those materials because we want to re-radiate heat or we want reflective coatings. And we're looking at new systems that we can use for higher temperatures. And those systems are really based on silica and some of them are with a little bit of alumina. And they're really fascinating materials. There's another class of materials that one can use for higher speed entries or when things get much hotter and those are ablative materials. Now the difference with those materials is that though they are high temperature materials, rather than staying the same during re-entry, what happens is that they burn, they char or they ablate. And so we handle the heat, in that case, by chemical consumption, by material consumption. And we have gases coming off, we form black carbonaceous char layers. And so those materials are basically only used once. So reusable materials don't really change, and those materials do. Ablated materials tend to be a mixture of such things as carbon fibers or even ceramic fibers with a polymeric material in them as well. And so in a way, that's a little bit of a stretch from real ceramic engineering, but in other ways, it's just the same because we're still making things, trying to understand how the materials behave and how they behave under the specific conditions of re-entry. Uh, and if we just think about re-entry coming into an atmosphere, the heating is really just coming from one direction rather than all overheating like we might see in a furnace. And so we have to test those materials in special ways. There's also another type of material that really is a ceramic that we're very interested in as well. And that's those materials called ultra-high temperature ceramics. Uh, those are materials in the diboride family, things like hafnium diboride or zirconium diboride, but they also include a lot of other things and carbides and borides and some nitrides. NASA and also the Air Force are interested in using those materials for hypersonic vehicles and for the, for the leading edges of those, of those vehicles. That includes the leading edges of wings and the nose tips and we want those and would like those to be very sharp or very pointy because in that case we have more maneuverability and better guidance on those, on those vehicles. However, that does require that the, that the materials operate at a much higher temperature than say a space shuttle tile or even a reinforced carbon carbon. So what I've been lucky enough to do for the past few years is lead a research effort on developing some of those materials. Uh, we have labs which we built up and for making those materials because I'm an experimentalist uh, who actually believes in modeling as well. But we have a very heavily, in our, our, our research effort is very heavily experimental uh, in which we're very interested in making things and processing materials and how can we change microstructure and composition to improve the properties of those materials. Now, some of that's really basic ceramic engineering. How do we put powders together? How do we do the heat treatments? A lot of it's understanding the chemistry and a lot of it's also understanding of how it is we want these materials to behave under specific conditions. Uh, it also involves some modeling work, um, which we're now starting to look at that right from the beginning, ab initio calculations, right on through finite element modeling as well 
because we also have to be able to understand how not only how to make these materials, to predict what their properties are, and how they might actually eventually behave during re-entry. Because we can't test everything for re-entry. We have to be able to model it as well. And so that's in fact a very, very big subject. So for somebody who started off life in ceramic engineering, um, doing things with clay, and then moved on to all kinds of other structural materials, always making things, always understanding properties, uh, this has become very exciting for me because now I'm involved in something much bigger, which is the space program. Before I worked for NASA, I worked for many years for a contract research organization, SRI International. And that was different and, and but very exciting in a different way because there we never knew what was going to happen every day. We never knew what new clients would want. And the problems we were given in those days were, were the hard ones, the ones that other people couldn't solve. We worked for government, we worked for companies, we worked for international clients. And so people would come to us with some problem perhaps or some, in many cases sometimes there was an energy source they had that needed to be used or they had a material that they, that they had that was maybe even in fact a waste material and what could they do with it. Um, and one of those clients came to us one day and said, uh, because of the energy business that they were in, it was the coke, coal business, that they had a lot of coke. And what could they do with it? <laughs> and there was some idea that perhaps we could make silicon carbide out of it. And so that was uh, pretty interesting. We looked at that and we said, uh-huh, how do we do that? Uh, but it's one of those things where I think it illustrates what I really believe in, which is teamwork and collaboration and getting people with slightly different views on things, people with more chemistry background, people who know how to make things, people who might know about coal and coke. And we eventually figured out, with a lot of trial and error actually, how we might actually make silicon carbide a very refractory grade for, uh, how we might make silicon carbide a refractory grade from coke. Um, other sorts of exciting things that we did uh, many years ago when high temperature superconductivity uh, became the rage and was all in the newspapers and we looked at what the physicists were doing and we read in the newspaper what the physicists were doing and they were just grinding things up. It was very, very basic. And so my colleagues and I said, well, we can do much better than that. <laughs> we know how to make these materials. This is a ceramics problem. So we went off um, without really getting permission to do it and developed a technique for doing it. Uh, we used a technique of freeze drying and we had developed that technique uh, for some other powders for a client um, and this shows how it all works together. The, the previous client had come to us years before with a problem where they had not waste heat, not waste energy, they had waste cold. <laughs> Uh, because of the way they were shipping liquefied natural gas. And what could they do with the cold? And so we thought about that and we said, well, okay, well, you can make some ceramic powders that way. And, but it turned out to be a bit harder than we thought. And they had tried also and they couldn't do it. And they said, you can't do it. And we said, yes, we can. And that was rather foolish, but in the end it worked out and we managed to make zirconia and alumina and a variety of ceramic powders that way. So we then adapted that process to make superconductors, um, but actually from chemicals. We did that in the end and we got to work with a lot of people, Stanford University, and, uh, and we're right there on the leading edge of that, of that development.